Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and honor to um, to be here with the uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Defense of the State of Israel, um, Dr. Ephraim Sneck. Uh, he has a very long and very uh, impressive uh, uh, biography, but I think that in this occasion I can say something which is not written in the biography, and that, that he was one of the few uh, within the uh, politicians which understood many years ago that Iran is becoming the real threat to the existence of the State of Israel. And when we, the professionals, try to convince many here in Israel and all around the world that it is going to happen if it will not be stopped, um, Dr. Ephraim Schnee was one of the very few who helped us to shape this uh, understanding and to fight against the ignorance of the others who could not understand the real situation uh, which is now the main factor um, to my uh, private view the main factor in the whole uh, picture of the Middle East that Iran is taking the lead and becoming a radical leader of the Middle East under nuclear umbrella. And, um, and Dr. Sne was really one of those who understood it very early and tried to help us to stop it, and we didn't succeed up till now. Now he's in a better position to, to do the job, and it will be, uh, I think, very interesting to hear his views now from the uh, sideline, but from the, uh, from the center of the decision-making system of the State of Israel. Dr. Sne, please. Good afternoon. Few details about Iran. Who is the president? Who is Ahmadinejad? Whom we hear all the time. He belongs to a school of thought, or if you like, a, a sort of a sect in the Iranian religious establishment, which believe that the return of the Shiite Messiah, the vanished Imam of the Mahdi, is supposed to happen very, very soon. More than that, he believes that he has a role, a divine role, in making uh, this arrival uh, very, very concrete in our lifetime, maybe even with, with, within several years. His faith, his conviction says that the Messiah, the Mahdi, will, will come back only as if there is a sort of Armageddon, a doomsday, a major global collision or calamity that at the result of it, the Shiite would govern the entire globe. Very few people know about it, but this is his conviction. I didn't uh, bring with me quotations, but Everything which I said is based on quotations of Ahmadinejad. More than that, when he was the mayor of Tehran, he paved a very broad boulevard in Tehran, and the reason for, the, for paving this avenue was that this is the route where the, when the Mahdi will come, he will drive in, in this avenue. Very concrete pre preparation. He is a serious man. So we have to understand part of his actions, not only his declarations, as stepping out as a result 
of his messianic belief. Of course, the elimination of the Jewish state is a part or indispensable part of this doomsday which should precede the arrival of the Mahdi. More than that, he, he, he says that the Mahdi actually appointed him as the president of uh, Iran. He advised him to, to run for presidency and he made his election possible. Uh, I don't think that these um, details are just, you know, for your curiosity, anecdotal details, but I think that we can learn something about the way this president thinks. Now, what is the strategy? What is the real strategy of Iran? Where are they heading? As I said, they consider themselves as a rising global power, not regional power, global power. And if I have to quote Ahmadinejad, he said, we are the rising sun and the United States is the setting sun. This is a comparison. To start with, they, their concrete aspiration is to build a territorial contiguity of Iranian influence from the border of Afghanistan to the Mediterranean. A Shiite belt or a Iranian, Iran dominated belt from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean. And what are the, the bricks of this wall that they try to build? They meddle already in Afghanistan something which they didn't do in the past, but they succeeded, they even, in a way, fought the Taliban, but now they changed their tactics in, in, in Western Afghanistan. Iraq, they succeeded so far to take advantage of the collapse of Saddam Hussein regime, the demise of Saddam Hussein, in order to actually build a Shiite federal state in the south, which is very clearly is under their direct influence, and in the central government of Baghdad, they infiltrated and captured several key positions, and they have a growing influence in the central government in Baghdad. Even in the Kurdish north, they meddle in their own way. And if the, the U.S. troops capture some high uh, senior intelligence officers of Al-Quds Force, which is the global intervention force of Iran, they were on the way to Kurdistan because they tried to undermine the federal government there in order either to influence Kurdistan or at least to prevent the activity of Iranian Kurds who want <coughs> more, more national and civil rights. Syria, they succeeded to build an alliance, strategic alliance with Syria and then the last step to reach the Mediterranean is Lebanon. Third of the Lebanese are Shiites, and they try by using the political power of, of the Shiites in Lebanon to take over the Lebanese government, to dominate it, or to paralyze it, either of the two. So, this is the, the, the contiguity of Iranian domination. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. They have another direction of, of ex 
expanding their influence, and it's the Gulf. They are very active in, active in Bahrain, where 70% of the population is Shia. They very actively undermine the government there. And m most, if not all, of their naval exercises are simulation of taking over the Strait of Hormuz, where most of the majority of the global oil flows. The, their eye is on the wealth of the Gulf oil. That's why the Gulf states are terribly scared. And believe me, they have good reason. Terror. You know, now, we have a sort of a ceasefire with the Palestinian organization. In Gaza, maybe, in a way, in the West Bank, who are the only organization who are active now, who launch the rockets to Israel every day? The Islamic Jihad. Which organization now actively prepares suicide bombing in Israel? Islamic Jihad. Even the Hamas is now relatively respecting the ceasefire. But the organization which every day violates the ceasefire by launching rockets to Israel, which we know prepares every day suicide bombing inside Israel is the Islamic Jihad. Who pays 100% of the Islamic Jihad budget? Terror. Plus a bonus for every Israeli that is killed in their operations. So they have a special incentive and uh, it seems to me that uh, the, only, the only member of the United Nations who pays bonus for killing uh, civilians is Iran. And Ambassador, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the only one. Now, but there is another organization which is, which is uh, takes the second place in activity, in terrorist activity today, and this is Shuada al-Aqsa. You may think that this is Shuada al-Aqsa, which you know, the, the, the military uh, wing of the Fatah. No, only by name it belongs to the Fatah. Actually, they were, they, they were bought by Hezbollah, which is an arm of, of, of uh, Iran, and actually they are directed, these squads, terror squads of Shuada al-Aqsa, they are now paid, directed, indirectly via Hezbollah, but the source of orders and money is from Tehran. So you can see that the real spoiler, the tireless spoiler of Israeli-Palestinian rapprochement is, is Iran. Just uh, a reminder, the, the, long, the long arm of Iranian terrorism is not only here in Israel in the territory. Just to remind you, the, the bombing of the uh, Israeli embassy and of the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. And to give you, a, you know, just an illustration, a, a, a short story which tells you what is the, not only the modus operandi, but the way of thinking of this regime, and it is the, the following story. In the <coughs> 90s, I think in the early 90s, uh, a United States a frigate, or, or destroyer, it doesn't make a difference, by mistake, by launching a surface to, or ship to air missile, uh, shoot down a civilian uh, Iranian uh, airliner. 
120 uh, innocent casualties, but it was a mistake. Years later, the wife of the commander of this ship was assassinated in a shopping mall in Los Angeles by a bomb put under her, her car. The, the method of revenge, no matter where, they reached her in the west coast of, of the United States, but they reached her. I said about uh, Lebanon as, as one of the countries in the region that they want to, uh, to take over, what is going right now in Lebanon, in Beirut, the effort to overthrow uh, Fuad Senora's government and using Hezbollah not only as a political tool, but mainly, and we are six, six months after the war in Lebanon, to, to build Hezbollah as a major military force, which can be, in a way, even a strategic threat on Israel, given its ability to launch thousands of rockets on the Israeli towns and villages. Maybe last characteristic for this re regime is the gruesome record of human rights, something which nobody in the world really cares about. But we have to, to bear it in mind. Let alone suppression of free press, journalists who are most of them in jail, no opposition candidate which, who can run for, uh, for uh, elected positions, but terrible ways of punishment in their uh, religious courts, amputations, killing by stoning, as I say, terrible, gruesome record um, of, of so-called human rights. It's, it's no, no human rights, but uh, even the most enlightened uh, countries in the world try to forget it. So now I go back to the title of this uh, talk of mine, The Implication of a Nuclear Iran. Now imagine that this regime, the powerhouse of terrorism in the region, with ambition of expansion and domin domination over the entire region, if not more of it, if this regime would have the power of nuclear blackmail, how the life in this region would look like. Not only Israel, but other countries as well. That's why we, we believe that everything should be done in order to, to avoid it, and uh, in this point, I am stopping in order to allow your questions and hopefully my answers. Uh, please identify yourself uh, before asking the question. It will help us uh, later to understand who asked what. Um, Okay, the, this is, it will be that you will ask the question, and then the um, deputy uh, of defense will answer all the questions together at the end. So please identify yourself so we can um, answer your questions directly. Uh, please. Daniel is from Reuters. <coughs> You've understandably described a very urgent situation as far as Israel is concerned, the West, with the Iranian nuclear program. 
given that it seems that open Israeli diplomacy has pretty much exhausted itself, Prime Minister Olmert just came back from finishing a tour of the uh, nations with permanent seats on the um, Security Council. Uh, resolution 1737 may come up again next month if, and everyone anticipates this will be the case, Iran continues to flout the, uh, uh, the conditions that it halt uranium enrichment. How do you see the way forward? Is Israel satisfied with Western diplomatic pressure? Or will it be forced to seek, seek an alternative? I'm also referring to the military option, not necessarily Israeli, potentially a, an American military option. I'm Anne Bernard from the Boston Globe. Um, I just wondered uh, whether, looking at the region, there are signs that uh, in the long run, Arab Sunnis might be more worried about Iran than they are about Israel, and whether there's any diplomatic opportunities there for Israel to exploit. I'm Diane Nessenbaum from the Miami Herald, and uh, General Harari was here last week talking about Iran's operations in Gaza. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could talk about. Oh yeah. Well, I'm wondering if you could just talk about what concrete evidence you have that Iran is providing weapons to militant groups in Gaza. Could the gentleman from the BBC please turn off the microphone for a second? It's not mine. It's an old microphone. It's not the microphone. Okay, I, I can shout. Good morning. It's working. Uh, I hear you without any mind. Very good. I'm Eric Silver from The Independent. Uh, I wanted to ask you how much of a limiting factor on Iran's ambitions is it that all the um, Shiite partners you mentioned or, or satellites that you mentioned are Arabs. How much it's important in their perception, as far as you understand it, that they are dealing and they are being sponsored by uh, Persian Shiites. In other words, are they totally in, in Iran's pocket or do they have reservations and inhibitions about uh, how far they will go as, as uh, allies or lackeys or however you want to put it of Iran. Can I also ask you a, a question outside the Iran uh, field, but since some of us are journalists, uh, you <laughs> said yesterday, I think, that uh, Israel has to start thinking about uh, releasing Marwan Barghouti from uh, prison. Can you elaborate a bit on your thinking there, the rationale for this idea? Thank you. Is George Bureau from the Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Switzerland, also a bit outside of the immediate uh, subject. You were this morning in Hebron. Could you tell us a bit about your trip there and uh, what did the government until now not know about the behavior of the settlers towards the Palestinians? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Uh, uh, if you can, to the microphone. Okay. Thank you. I am Bela Jungler, Hungarian representative to the Palestinian Authority. I would like to ask you, sir, in your view, how homogeneous is the Iranian political entity now? I mean, from different public and less public sources, we know that there are some evaluations that there is a kind of potential opposition uh, against Ahmadinejad. Could the international community contribute to strengthen this uh, possible opposition, or could we manage to create from outside some realistic changes inside Iran? Thank you.
Okay, uh, I think that uh, you'll begin again, the, the last one, and then we will make another round if we will have a time. I'm Ambassador Galvecchio, Ambassador of Croatia, and I would like to hear your comment about what is the main purpose of uh, President Ahmedijan, Ahmedinejad, uh, 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 diplomatic activities, especially now in the South America. Uh, to, to your question, I, though it took I think three and a half years from, from the moment that the International Agency for Atomic Energy in Vienna found, found out that the Iranians have been cheating the world for 18 years, till the moment when the Security Council took its recent uh, resolution, it took three and a half years, very, very slowly. But we still think that the international community did not say its last word. And there is now a very concrete challenge. The resolution from December 23rd or 24th, the, the recent resolution of the Security Council gave 60 days to Iran to stop the enrichment of the Iranian, and if not, a further sanctions Will be, will be taken. Let's wait patiently till February 23rd. I assume that more or less around this date will be another expression of Iranian defiance about the nuclear issue. Area. And then this is a challenge for the international community. And, and by the way, all of them are potential victims of the same Iranian bomb. What will they do? I think that more can be done when it comes to sanctions. And I can offer two, two <coughs> ideas. One, as you know, Iran imports 40% of its consumption of um, oil distillates especially gasoline for cars, 40% embargo on the, the supply of gasoline and other distillates of oil to Iran can create a very serious problem to the regime. Why not to try? credit in the European financial markets. They are dependent on the flow of, of, um, of money from Europe. Credit, the service for this, um, for this um, financial services. Why the European as well as the American banks cannot take an action? So here are two very, very simple ideas which can make a difference. I don't speak about other options. Let's start with something which is, which is very, very, I would say, of course, bloodless. Very clean. Very simple. If there is such a bargain, do you believe that there is a, a shipping company in the world which would consider it worthwhile to, to bring gasoline to, to Iranian port and then it would, be, uh, it would not be able to enter to any of the U.S. seaports? I don't think so. So? There is no, there is no, there is no contradiction between the two. The fact 
that I'm afraid that nobody takes it too seriously in Europe and other, uh, let's say mainly in Europe, doesn't mean that they shouldn't take an action. What I, what I call upon is, wake up! Why should they take action for themselves? Why should they? Because we are the first victim on the list, but we are not the, first, the last one. And if you analyze the ideology of this regime, it may start with us, but we are not the last one on their list, because there they despise the entire culture which you and me share. That's the point. Because they, they want to undermine all the reasonable, if not to say moderate, Arab regimes, and they want to, to, over, to, to overthrow them. That's why. Because if they succeed, will be no allies to the Western democracies in this region. That's why. Because they would have a, a, a power of, of, of blackmail, of, of, of stifling the world as far as the flow of oil is concerned. That's why. And I, and I hate to, to go to those historical analogies, but I can't resist saying that the Jews were always the first victims of evil, but they were not the last. There is no contradiction between what I said, you remember better than I do, you are younger than me, uh, what I said a month ago in time, yes, generally we are disappointed, we are disappointed. Why should it take three and a half years? Okay, since it happened, we welcome this resolution of the, of the UN Security Council. Sixty days, let's wait sixty days. What's next? So this is my my answer to your question: How to go? How to proceed? How to go forward? I don't go beyond it. I 